This is Lauren Sherman from the Global Fertility Academy. I recently sat down with several of the world's top thought leaders and we discussed several of the challenges and opportunities facing fertility professionals today. Join me for this exciting interview. Many women in today's society choose to delay childbearing for numerous reasons, including education and career opportunities. However, as healthcare professionals know, the aging ovaries are often result in decline in the number of oocytes and the quality of those that remain. Recent advances in emerging preventative solutions for women are becoming an increasing topic of discussion in the fertility specialist community. With our patients and even uh, that toughest ethical discussion. Today we have Dr. Marjorie Dixon with us to discuss these advancements and what they mean to you, your fertility practice, and your patients. Now, Marjorie, as we were talking a little bit earlier, I, I think the real challenge for you is that tough question, that tough situation. So you want to talk a little bit about how it's a, a, a tough environment that you have to get through sometimes? Yeah, I think that women, because women are used to empowering themselves, we are people who feel that we can control what the outcome will be in our life. We exercise, we eat well, um, have good diets, take care of ourselves, stop smoking. Um, but we haven't managed to successfully change the evolution of the ovary. So when I tell a woman that the reason why she um, might be thinking about freezing her eggs is because as she's getting older, and older being as young as 34, 35, 36, that the quality of her eggs is diminishing significantly. And when they're considering things like even freezing their eggs, they may not even be a candidate after I've evaluated them. And that is shock to them. So, so where do you go from there? Well, I explain to them that you have to look at an, on a case-to-case -case basis. And broad strokes is that, you know, we have the early reproductive lifespan, the mid-reproductive lifespan, and the later reproductive lifespan. And the early is 16 to 28, and mid is 28 to 38, and then late is 39 to 44. And they're like, well, I'm only 33 years old. You think I'm mid-reproductive range? I'm like, well, that's what we know. And we know about the biology of the egg. And that is often shocking to people. And we were also discussing a little bit earlier about how even successful freezing doesn't necessarily correlate with successful outcomes. So um, how do you talk to patients about that and, and what's your thought about that? Well, I tell them that it's important to be counseled because um, in North America, at least where I'm from in Toronto, social egg freezing has gained popularity. Um, so women come in thinking, well, I'm going to do a cycle of IVF like my friend and I'll be done. And then I have to explain that there, we need to have a certain number of mature eggs. We need to know if your egg quality is good enough for you to even be a candidate to do this. And the older you are, the worse off we are. So we want to get a critical number, and a critical number is 20 to 25 eggs, which is a lot of eggs and may require two or even maybe three retrievals so that we can feel comfortable that they have a good shot of take-home baby. So that is often surprising to women, but that's what the literature has shown us. So a lot of what you have to do is really strong, deep, and challenging patient education. Yes. Absolutely. Um, what resources do you use and could others refer to in helping to have those conversations and to do really good patient education? So I use referring to the ASRM guidelines, the committee practice guidelines are some great things to look at. Um, I use the literature also where they have larger cohorts of um, women who have undergone the egg freezing and also there's some meta-analyses from good studies um, that give us honest and real opinions about or knowledge about what comes out because women even ask the questions will the babies be okay like are you sure that when I freeze my eggs and now that I can thaw them and and they can be fertilized are there problems with the babies and I have to say well we have larger studies but the biggest cohort might be a thousand women where we know that it's safe enough to do but the long-term data, we don't know. So there's not an increase in aneuploidy, we know. Mm -hmm. There's not an increase in congenital anomalies that we can tell, that we know as well from the large studies. But the long-term data, especially with the vitrification, is still just not there. So while the, the experimental status from the SRM has been lifted, we still do have some more information gathering to do. Well, I think in timelines sometimes, right? So, so thinking of where we were five years ago Absolutely. to where we are now, where do you think we'll be in five years? I think in five years we'll have a much better understanding, um, but I think we're headed the right way. I know that because of this paradigm shift that people 
are waiting longer to think about having babies. They're actually wanting to partner with people that they like instead of just whoever they meet first, right? And for women who don't have a partner and who want to have the ability or options for them moving forward, these are now viable options. And before, they weren't so much. It can only get better. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about and, and sort of address as we're sort of moving on from that topic? Um, I think that beyond just egg freezing, when we are looking at the advances in science, the exciting things, the, well, you know where I come from, the precursor cell biology and, and the potential to even grow eggs from precursor cells. It changes what we understand, that whole we're born or we're maxed out at age 20 weeks in utero when we have six to seven million eggs. By the time we're born, it's one to two, uh, menarche, 400, 200, 400,000, and then by the end of menopause at 51, we have about 1,000 eggs left. What if we can rejuvenate those follicles? What if we can recruit more of these precursor cells? I think the, the, the potential is, is exciting. So it's changing that curve, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to start thinking, though, is it a good thing to help older women to have babies when they're past 45, 46, into that perimenopausal range? when then there are health problems. The maternal fetal medicine specialists keep yelling in the back of my ear <laughs> about what we're doing and, and really thinking about the, the greater repercussions of it. Right, so, so I guess my last question on that would be, yeah. how do you address and, and deal with that risk to benefit ratio? I have open and honest discussions with the patients. And as I say, you have to take it on a case-to-case -case basis. Not every 43-year-old is the same. People have medical comorbidities, and then people can be completely great. And that's why it's so important for people to have a consultation with a physician in and of themselves and not rely on what their friends or someone else has told them about their experience, because each person's experience can be very different. So you thrive on the heterogeneity of the patient population. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, great. Uh, it was excellent talking to you yeah, today. Yeah, it was nice talking to you too.